you have your Bibles, turn with me to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. We are doing practical life lessons right now. Uh, we've, this is our third one. Um, we will start a new series. Uh, I got a confirmation this past week from the Lord, and I'm going to start that in January. And uh, we are going from Acts straight into the book of Romans, is what the Lord told me to do. Uh, so I will follow the Lord uh, with all my heart. Uh, I want to talk to you today about testing your faith, testing your faith. Uh, folks, we have all been there. Uh, life can be challenging at times, and to be honest with you, folks, life can be hard. You know, it's not all a bed of roses. I think sometimes people think, you know, when they get saved, you know, you're put in bubble wrap and you don't have to sweat things and, you know, you don't have to go through things. But uh, as we see in the days in which we are living our life is challenging, and there are times are, that are very, very hard. But the deal you have to understand, and this is just a, a sentence that I like to use, uh, you have to understand as Christians, God is with us, God is in us, and God is for us in all circumstances of life. We as Christians have things that the world doesn't have, and one of those things is the Trinity uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit looking over us. And I want to say uh, there are all kinds of tests that we have as Christians. Uh, the test of faith is one, a test of sickness or even physical challenges, a test of mental challenges, test of emotional challenges, uh, family difficulties, another test, and financial difficulties, and test in relationships are all tests that we have in our life. And you have to understand, uh, there's three reasons trials and tests comes to Christians, all right? Number one, poor choices, okay? Some of them you bring on yourself. You can't blame anybody else. You chose, you decided to do this, and things did not go well because you are a child of God, all right? The second one, and this is Job, is a direct attack from Satan, okay? Satan does not want you happy. Satan does not want the joy of the Lord to be your strength. Satan does not want you, uh, you know, to, to uh, you know, thrive, and, and he doesn't want you to share with others. So sometimes it's just plain old spiritual warfare. And then the third reason, and this is the one people have trouble with, is the Lord puts you there for a specific purpose. The Lord put you there for a specific purpose. And I'm telling you, Lazarus is the one that sticks out in my mind, okay? Uh, Mary and Martha, you talk about having an attitude. If you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. But what they did not understand was there was going to be more glory of him being raised from the dead than Jesus and healing him of sickness. Because he healed a lot of folks, folks, during that, that time. But he had never raised the dead. And so you could see where, uh, you know, and the reason he does it, okay, the bottom line is, is for your good and for his glory. And we don't like it at times. We don't like tests, all right? Matter of fact, there are people that when you hear, heard the word test in school, you just got all nervous and choked up. You lost sleep and... And, but folks, tests are good, okay? Tests are good, and we can see this uh, in our text here. Matter of fact, when you think of all the ones that I just named, all the tests that come in our lives, folks, Job experienced every one of those things in his life, and in a short period of time. So bottom line, you have to have a test to have a testimony. The word testimony starts with a test. So let's look at Scripture this morning. Job chapter 1, verse 1. Oh, I didn't do the outline, did I? Number one, the test of prosperity. Our outline in your bulletin, follow along with this. The test of prosperity. You say, what are you talking about? Folks, there are people, everything is going good. There are no problems in their lives. And you know what they do? They tend to leave God out. They're self-sufficient. They're self-sufficient. You must be aware of that. Number two, the test of character. 
And I'm telling you, Satan will test your character. Okay, He will see what you are made of. And number three, the test of adversity. We all have situations in our life that test us, and they're trials. And sometimes, you know, it's agony, sometimes it's suffering, sometimes it's hurting, but there are tests of adversity. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and it was a land close to Edom. And that man was blameless and upright. It's not that he was perfect, but he was a righteous man. He walked with God. He was in intimate fellowship with God. He wasn't perfect, but I'm telling you, his moral character was outstanding and upright and one who feared God, not being afraid of God, but respecting God, being in awe of God, knew how to worship God, and shunned evil. Folks, we need to shun evil. We talked about that last week. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. So he had ten children. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep. Folks, you've got to understand, in those days, it wasn't a bank account. The more cattle you had, the, the, the more money that you had and the possessions that you had. So when you look at this, I mean everything's going his way. Uh, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large household, which meant his house was big, and I would say if you have 10 kids, you're going to have to have a big house. So this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. So everyone knew who Job was. Everyone probably knew where Job lived. Everyone thought, man, if I could have his life, I am telling you, I would make it. I would arrive. All right, people would respect me. All these things Job had. Verse 4, and his sons would go up and feast in their houses on his appointed day. And probably appointed day were birthdays. So even the family, the, the siblings were close and had fellowship with one another. And would send and invite uh, their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise up early in the morning and offer burnt offering. Uh, according to the number of them all. And in that, it is indicating that during this time of feasting, there was probably some drinking going on, okay? There was probably some things going on that didn't need to go on. You say, why, Brother Mike? Because of the next sentence, okay? For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did regularly. So what did he do? He offered burnt offerings for his sons and daughters. Now folks, we don't do that nowadays, but do you know what we can do when our kids are in trouble, when our kids are not following God, when our kids walk away from the church, and when our kids uh, do things that sh they should not be doing? Folks, we pray for our children. We pray for our grandchildren. And there are times in our lives that, that God attacks our family and attacks a specific people in our family. And we have to understand, during those intense times, it's time where we begin to pray and become prayer warriors on behalf of our children and our grandchildren. I understand, folks, we can't live our lives or their lives for them. They are going to make choices, but they have to live with the choices that they make. All we can do is be an example to them of what a Christian is and encourage them in the faith, all right? Not belittle them, not just hammer them all the time. A lot of times they need love, they need encouragement, and I'm not talking about enablement. That's a different thing. But when kids go astray, folks, we need to pray for them. Romans chapter 5, go with me if you would to Romans 5. And here, faith triumphs in trials. Therefore, Romans 5 verse 1, therefore having been justified by faith, and folks, I'm telling you, our kids, our grandkids, 
People in our families can let us down. They can let us down. They can hurt us deeply. But we have been justified by faith. We are Christians, and we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I got news for you, folks. God knows what's going on. He knows, and he asks us as parents and as grandparents to pray for those kids through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We can talk to God 24-7. We can begin our day in prayer. We can end our day in prayer. We can wake up in the middle of the night and pray for our kids and our grandkids. We can't change them. Only God can change them. And folks, I believe with all my heart, God can save anyone who calls upon his name. We have access by faith to this grace which we stand. Rejoice in hope in the glory of God. What is it is he saying? Folks, never quit praying. Never give up. Never to think, never to think it's an impossible situation. I don't care how long it goes on. Folks, I'm telling you, God can change people's hearts. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations or trials or tests. We glory in them, he says, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. What is he saying? And I heard a preacher say this one, one time. He says, whatever doesn't kill you will make you stronger. He is working on our character. He is working on our faith. He is working on our prayer life during these times, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, per perseverance, character, character, hope. You go through that. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Folks, the Holy Spirit will prompt you to pray. The Holy Spirit will prompt you to what you should say. The Holy Spirit would prompt you on what you should do and what you shouldn't do. So we're not left alone. You're not the only parent going through this issue. These things have been going on for centuries, centuries. And He is there for us. You are never alone, folks. And I know it breaks your heart. I've had a broken heart. I've, I've, I've prayed, I've cried, I've sobbed over things going on in life. But all the time, God would share with me, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Stay focused. Keep your eyes on me. So we see the test of prosperity where everything is going good, but all at once, it goes south on you. Folks, don't despair. And the second thing I want you to see is the test of character. Look at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And of course those are angels that we are talking about. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And again we know Satan can only be at one place at one time. All right, He can only be, in, but, but he can go from, from different places all, all around. He can be on one side of the earth, and then he could get to the other side. But, uh, you know, our God, folks, I'm telling you, he is sovereign God. You can pray a prayer in any country, and I don't know how he hears all the prayers, but God is, is omnipresent, folks. He is with every Christian, wherever they are. So Satan answered and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth, on it. What's he doing? Folks, he's seeking those whom he may devour. He's looking for Christians, folks. He wants to discourage you. He wants to test your faith. He wants to tell you that God doesn't care or God's not listening or where is God in all this. And I know the one question that always comes up in sermons like this is why? Why? Folks, I promise you, God doesn't waste suffering. He has something for you. He has a lesson to be learned. He is growing your character. He is growing you as a Christian. 
Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil? The second description of Job. But notice whose mouth it comes out of. Folks, it's the Lord's mouth. Man, I hope someday I could get to where the Lord will say that about me. He wasn't perfect, but I'm telling you, he walked with God. He had done nothing wrong. Job was not being punished. Matter of fact, his friends, I'm just telling you, it was crazy. You know, if you read, read the whole book, you know, they're basically saying, man, you got bad sin in your life. It must be bad if God's doing these things to you. And folks, it's not always the case. Verse 9, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does God fear, does Job fear God for nothing? So what does Satan always do? He is the accuser. He is accusing Job of following God because of his prosperity, because of his uprightness, because of his blamelessness. And he almost is saying, I bet Job, Job is your pet. He's your pet. He, you like him better than anyone else. So you just put this little bubble around him. That's the deal. Verse 10, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Folks, Satan knows what's going on. Satan knows what's going on. Here's the deal, folks. God can read your mind. God can hear your voice. Satan can only hear your voice he can't read your mind. So some of you need to quit talking, all right? Quit telling him who that person is that is a problem, all right? Why? Because Satan will run them right by you. He'll put them on you. So listen, he is. He, he was accusing him. Look at verse 11. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So what is he saying? He's saying, if you'll just take your hand off of him, and if you'll let me have him for a little bit, he will curse you. Even though he is the best Christian example on the face of the earth. In verse 12, and the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. What was God saying? You can't kill him. You can do anything want. Earthwise, you can do anything you choose, but you can't kill him. Why? Because Satan wants to kill Christians, folks. He wants them off the earth. He doesn't want their witness and their influence in life. Why do you think our missionaries die in third world countries? I'm telling you, it's because of Satan, folks. Satan rouses up lost sinners, and it happens. And God says there's just one rule. You can do what you want, but you can't touch his life. You cannot take his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And folks, I'm telling you, uh, you know, there's just all this going on in his life. And, and he, here's the deal, folks. If he can't get to you, he will get to someone else close to you. All right? I mean, Satan would love to get to me and, and I'm just telling you, folks, you have to be prayed up. You have to be alert. You have to recognize, uh, you know, the satanic and the spirit, spiritual warfare that's going on. But if he can't get to me, the next best thing is my family. Look in chapter 2, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. And again, in the first three verses, it says again, Satan comes to God. And the same thing is read that's already been read. So look at verse 4. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and surely uh, he will surely curse you to his face. So he says, what do I need to do? I'm going to attack his health. Well, folks, I'm telling you, our health is something that we should cherish. Our health is something that we should, uh, you know, we do need to eat right. We do need to, you know, do, do the right things with our bodies. But I'm telling you, he wanted to get to Job. 
Verse 6, and the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. He said it again. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the soles of his foot to the crown of his head. Folks, I don't know if you've ever had boils, but I've read description and people have told me that have had boils and they are extremely painful. Extremely painful. He attacked Job's health. Verse 8, and he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of ashes. I don't want to get too graphic in this, but I'm simply saying the blood and the scabs and all that were itching so bad that he would literally take and scratch those wounds and put ashes on them to make them feel better. Verse 9, then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Folks, I am telling you, you have to understand, if he can't get to you, he will get to someone close to you. Okay? That was not what she needed to say. That was not any form uh, you know, of, of encouragement whatsoever. And he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept the good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? And in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. You know what true faith is, folks? True faith is obeying God in spite of your feelings, in spite of the circumstances, and even in spite of the consequences. True faith is serving God in the good times and in the bad. Folks, anybody can serve God when things are going well. But when you lose your health, folks, we've seen this in the coronavirus. We've seen this where people have died. Our church family have died. Others were close to death. Others have been really sick. But you have to understand, folks, you must keep going. You must keep fighting. You must keep believing. God is in the healing business. He can heal. He has healed. And he will heal. So he attacked. Satan attacks Job's character and then he attacked his physical body. Hey, can I say this? Folks, Satan doesn't play fair, all right? He doesn't play fair. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care how bad you're hurting. He doesn't care how long you're hurting. And one of the things, as I was growing up, I always heard my grandmother say, I need the patience of Job. Anybody hear that saying? You know what it's saying? And folks, it goes with the book of Job. There were 42 chapters, okay? He had to listen to his friends uh, all right, accusing him through all this. His wife just told him, let me give you some advice. Just curse God and die. Well, that's not good advice, folks. We need to live. We need to fight through these things. We need to put our faith and trust in God. We need God in every part of our lives. So we see the test of prosperity. We see the test of character. Satan is the accuser. And folks, he will not give up. He'll go away for a season, but he will not give up. Be ready. Be ready to fight. That's what spiritual warfare is. Now look at our third thing. The third thing. The test of adversity. The test of adversity. And I'm telling you, Job could have said why. He could have easily said why, but he didn't. Look at verse 13. Now, there was a day when the sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside themselves. And, we, and when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away, indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. What did he do? He lost part of his stock. Verse 16, and while he was still speaking, another came also and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and these servants and consumed them. 
and alone they have escaped. Some people think God did it, but folks, lightning, lightning can set a field on fire. Okay? Lightning can do that. And again, the guy says, I alone have escaped. Verse 17, and while he was speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands and raided the camels and took them away. And yes, killed the servant with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. I'm telling you that third time, I would tell him, don't come back, okay? Three times, bad news and bad news and bad news. Can I give you just a, a little advice today? Don't make this statement. Okay, I told you Satan hears everything you say. Don't say what else could happen. You are not wise to say that. Folks, realize that nothing comes into your life that God doesn't allow to come. Folks, he's sovereign. He is God. He's God. And we're not always going to be in the good times. There are times we have to go through the valleys the valley of the shadow of death, says Psalm 23. So don't make that statement. Verse 18, and while he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. He lost all ten of his children. Folks, my heart goes out to any parent that loses a child. My heart goes out to any mother that loses a baby. But I cannot imagine ten caskets lining up in one service for Job and his wife. It, 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 was, it was devastating to them. Everything, the cattle you can replace, all the other stuff. You can rebuild houses. Uh, you know, you, there's a lot. But there's a part of you. Folks, they literally came from you. And that is a time when, when sometimes I know we just have to, to depend on God and cry out to God and pray to God and understand that He is there for you he loves you with all of his heart. And then Job, look at verse 20, arose and tore his robe, which is a, a sign of mourning, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. Oh, folks, I pray to God that I can do that as a Christian father and as a Christian grandfather. And I pray that I would not lose my faith and lose hope. Folks, I am telling you, no matter what's going on in your life, God is worthy of our worship. And folks, I do not understand people that run from God in times like these. They drop out of church. They, they, just, they just feel abandoned. They just feel like God is picking on them. And folks, that is not the case according to to the Word of God. We must run to God in times like this. We must be quick to get on our knees. That's what he did. He fell to the ground and worshiped. And listen to his statement. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. Okay? I brought nothing into this world. I'm not taking anything out. The Lord is given and the Lord has taken away. Folks, what did he take? If you look at his life, just about everything. And then Job said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Folks, what a test. We will probably never in our life experience a test like that. But can you imagine the testimony that Job had Everyone knew him. Everyone respected him. Everyone looked up to him. And his statement was worship. His statement was blessed be the name of the Lord. In verse 22, and in all this, 
Job did not sin nor charge charge uh, God with any wrong. Folks, I believe this is probably one of the greatest tests known to mankind in the history of mankind. And Jesus did. I'm, I'm not, I, I understand Jesus and all that, but just a man born of a woman uh, uh, and, and another man, I'm just telling you, it was a huge test in his life. And folks, you can read all the way through the rest of the book of Job, but go to Job 42 with me. Job 42. Let's look at the conclusion of the story here. <coughs> Excuse me. Job 42, verse 10. And there was, if you'll read about from 38, chapter 38 on, finally God heard all this going on, and basically God says, where were you when I created the earth? Where were you when I created the water? Where were you? Okay? And folks, it's one thing. I know doubt can slip into our lives, but we must understand, don't stay there. Don't let it consume you. Yes, everybody falls at some time. Yes, people get discouraged at times, and that's the human part of us. But I'm telling you, with God's help, you can come out of it. He loves you. He cares about you. He knows what you're going through. Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then in Job 10, or 42, 10, and the Lord restored Job, Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. He prayed for those ones who doubted him. He prayed for those ones who said that, hey, you're a fool for what you're doing. He prayed for those who discouraged him. He just kept praying. And I'm telling you, folks, prayer is so, so important. We do not pray enough. We, don't, we do not pray intensely enough. We do not pray uh, from the heart enough. And I understand we all pray. But I'm simply saying our prayer lives in times like these need to go off the scale. When we wake up in the middle of the night, we need to be praying. When we're consumed with this, we need to be praying. And we need to, to, to pray, and, and prayer should need, needs to take the place of worry and take the place of fears in our lives. And indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then all his brothers and all of his sisters and all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him, ate the food with him in his house, and they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversity that the Lord had brought upon him. Okay? Gave him back the cattle. Gave him back children. Restored everything in his life. Why? Because he was a faithful servant because he didn't walk out on God, because he trusted God, because he showed a strong faith, God restored him. Each one gave him a piece of silver, and each one a ring of gold. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. Folks, I am telling you, it doesn't take possessions to make us happy, folks. They're good to have. I understand we've got to pay the bills. But knowing God is there, knowing that you're right with God, knowing that you reacted right regardless what everyone was saying around you, having faith and trusting God. And folks, think about it. Just think about it. Even if he did not give him all of that, folks, we have heaven. We are going to live forever and ever with our Lord and Savior. I'd like to close with one scripture, and you know this scripture, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Oh, God's going to work it out. God's going to work it out. Why? Why do these happen? Why? What is the answer to why? For our good to make us stronger, 
but even more important than that, for His glory. Folks, God Himself sacrificed His own Son. God knows what it's like to lose a son. And God is here for every one of you today. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what you're going through, but God does. And this word, and in God's word, I promise you there is a solution. Sometimes we just have to hang on. We just have to hold on. We have to wait for God. I, I say this and I'll say it again. Of the nine fruits of the Spirit, the one we, we master last is patience. We want it and we want our prayers answered today. We want it now. And folks, God doesn't work that way. We have to get on His timetable. We have to trust in Him. Father, thank You for this lesson in life. And God, there is no doubt in my mind there are many people here going through some of what Job has went through. And God, I pray that You would just give them strength. God, I pray that You would strengthen their faith. God, I pray that You would strengthen their might, Lord. Sometimes it is. It's hard to get out of bed sometimes. It's hard to put one foot in front of the other sometimes. But God, I pray we wouldn't give up. I pray we wouldn't quit. I pray we would not throw in the towel. God, I pray that you would just do a work in our lives. God, thank you for salvation. Thank you for always being there. Thank you for the scripture that says you never leave us and you never forsake us. So God, I pray first for the Christian for the Christian who's hurting today. God, I pray that you would just mend that broken heart. God, I pray that you would just give encouragement to that one who is discouraged. God, I pray that they would realize that you're the King of kings and Lord of lords, and there's nothing that you can't do. So God, encourage them in the faith today. And God, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, they've never been saved, they don't even know what I'm talking about. They don't understand faith and and God, I pray, Lord, that you would just convict them. And God, I pray that they would come and be saved, God. I pray that they would come and give their heart and life to Christ. Lord, if there's there, those who need to rededicate their life or uh, join this church, or Lord, even come for baptism, whatever, Lord, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them. God, this is your church. These are your people. God, speak to us. Come down, show your power, God. Show your glory this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?